record. Uh, All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. We are in week four of Advocacy Days. Um, 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 for those who don't know me, um, my name is Taylor Crisp. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I've got a blurred background. My hair is pulled back and I'm wearing a gray sweater. And uh, with me, I have my favorite co-host um, and I'm gonna let her introduce herself. Oh, thanks Taylor. Good morning, everybody. My name's Tanika. I am your other co-host for this week. Well, for this year, for Advocacy Day. <laughs> my name is Tanika. I come to you. So Taylor's all the way out in Spokane. I'm on the other side of the state over in Pierce County down in DuPont. So thank you for joining us today. I am, uh, I work for PAVE and most importantly, I am mom to a 10 year old who is on the autism spectrum. So we're so happy you joined us today. Um, for my visual description, I am an African-American woman. I have on a tan sweater today. I have a big fro, I'm wearing some gold earrings, and I have a blurred background, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, so thank you for joining us for Advocacy Days today. Our topic is how do we support families uh, to support their loved ones? So thank you for joining us. Um, we have some little fun tips for folks who are joining us. Um, so this year we have a whole team of people who are helping. Um, so thank you to our interpreters. And we do have um, people who are helping us monitor the chat. So the chat is all for everybody to have a conversation. And then we have another feature this year, which is our Q&A button. So if you have any questions, please go over to the Q&A and drop your question in there. And we have someone who's moderating that as well. Um, and that is under your little more. It'll say more at the bottom of your screen. It's got little three little, uh, what are those dots on the top? You click it and it'll pop up and you can see where the Q&A is. Um, so, and, and just as a heads up, um, we might not answer your question right when you ask it because we might be answering it. It might be later on in the program. Um, so please don't, don't worry. We will get to your question. Um, just make sure you please put it in the Q&A so we can see it. We might miss it if it's in the chat. Um, so again, thank you for welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. And I think I covered it all. Did I miss anything that I was supposed to say, Taylor? Not really. I was just gonna, uh... I put it, I put some of what I said in the chat, but uh, I just want to also remind people to select uh, English as Spanish for your preferred language for our, um, our amazing interpreters and, uh, and stay muted. Please stay muted when you're speaking or not speaking. And then when you are speaking, uh, just speak at a decent pace for the interpreters so they can accommodate those with um, other language needs and necessities. Um, and uh and yeah, I think uh, we're good to go. So if we want to kick it off to to Kathy to um, go over the topic or, um, yeah. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. I, I was also going to mention that the other thing you can use the Q&A for is if you need to have um, some sort of accommodation need um, or are having difficulties, please use the Q&A box because I think our chat box gets moving kind of fast. Um, and so we want we want to be able to see that. So if you're having difficulties with that, please use the Q&A. So good morning. It's good to have you here. Welcome to Advocacy Day. This is our fourth Advocacy Day this year, which is just great. It seems like it's going so fast. Um, our topic is how do we support families to support their loved ones? And so I just want to give a little, um, you know, kind of overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, we know that families are the main care provider for people with disabilities um, throughout their lives. It, for adults in Washington state, 53% of them live with a parent or a relative. And we know that families are going to be that main caregiver throughout, oftentimes throughout their life, um, and will be involved. Um, so, you know, our system really relies on families to um, support 
support them. Um, if we all, sh you know, I always say, if we all showed up one day and said that families were going to quit providing care to their loved ones, the state would be in a really bad place because there would not be enough resources to adequately serve everyone. So, um, you know, we're in imp really important in this process. So we need to make sure that we take care of our families. Um, you know, some of the things that we need um, to, to, to support our family members is we need support from other parents. And we're going to hear from somebody that's going to talk about parent to parent in a, a little bit because in that it really you know, knowing somebody that's been there and done that is really helpful. Um, you know, we need to make sure that there is affordable and accessible child care. Um, and we know that that is often a real issue that, you know, when families go to seek that, um, oftentimes they're turned away um, or they don't know how to accommodate. And it, it is really problematic for families. So we need know we need to have affordable, accessible, and I guess I would add inclusive child care so that um, families can work and do what they need to do. Families also need a break from caregiving. Um, you know, what? no matter who you are, you, you need to have sometimes some time to yourself, to catch your breath, to re to strengthen yourself, and um, that can come through a lot of different ways. Whether it's through respite, or um, you know, your loved one going away maybe for camp, um, but it's really important that families have that so they can um, continue to care give throughout their lives. And then families need adequate supports so that they can care for their loved one at home. And then they need to be able to plan for the future. So we've all talked about the different kinds of things that, you know, we hear regularly about, you know, we need a system that it's easy to use so that, you know, it's, we spend a lot of our time and energy fighting for things <laughs> and having to advocate. Um, so we need that kind of support um, so that we can better, we want to spend our time caring for our loved one, not messing with the system and then we need to you know be able to plan so that when we cannot um, care for our loved one anymore or they choose to to live somewhere else that we have the supports in place to be able to um, be assured that our loved one will, will be well taken care of so anyway that is the big picture of some of the things we're going to talk about today, we're going to hear from different people that have some different things they're working on about how we support families. Um, so with that, I'm going to start off with uh, a video um, about from, that came from one of our legislators. Let me move that along. And um, I, I'll tell you, whoop, whoop, good, pop it there for just a second. Um, you should know that this is a pretty generic video. It's not specific to people with IDD. This is Representative Tana Sen. She wanted to be with us today. She She's really a busy lady and couldn't be with us. So some things she wanted to know at, that she has been working on are um, that relate to us in one way or the other, um, are she um, created the trauma-informed care grants in something called Fair Start for Kids. I'm not real familiar with that, but she said that it was really important um, for us. She's also the sponsor of 1916, the Early Support for Infants and Toddlers Bill that is fixing um, uh, a, a funding gap for infant our infants and toddler system so that's super important um she's also done some provisos on autism to reduce the wait time for diagnosis and evaluation and this is really important when we think about this in context of child care is she has a commitment to reviewing and streamlining the special needs rate for working connections child care 
So she's really wants to work on that so that when you have the subsidy, that it'll be easier to use and that it, um, you um, should be able to access child care better than you can now. So I think I need to stop for sharing for one second because I think I for forgot to turn the sound on. Hold on. And Kathy, this is Diana. I'm just going to throw in something that was in the chat. And I know it's also on a lot of people's minds is not just child care, but adult care for their adults with disabilities. Yeah. And we're going to hear about that after a bit. Yes. All righty. Let's see. Okay, are you seeing the screen again? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Representative Tana Sen, and I want to talk to you about a topic close to my heart, childcare in Washington State. Back in 2021, we achieved a landmark victory with the passage of the Fair Star for Kids Act. This historic legislation invested $1.1 billion into expanding access to affordable, high-quality early learning and child care for families across our state. But COVID was relentless, resulting in school closures and our first responders and health care providers desperately needed child care. In response, our extraordinary child care providers rose to the challenge, showing unparalleled commitment. We matched their dedication by introducing new healthcare coverage for childcare professionals and injecting over $480 million in emergency funds to support our childcare network, from family homes to centers and community-based care. As we look at the COVID pandemic in the rearview mirror, we're heartened to see the childcare sector growing again. But childcares are struggling. With low wages, long hours, and growing mental health issues among our kids, our dedicated providers are working in challenging conditions. Yet parents need childcare to go to work. But this is not just a workforce issue. It's about the well-being of our children, families, and economy. The financial burden on families is also unacceptable. Childcare costs as much as college tuition. Looking ahead, our mission is crystal clear, to ensure affordable, accessible, and high-quality childcare for every family in Washington. We're taking critical steps to lower costs for families, increase wages and growth opportunities for childcare workers, build more child cares, and celebrate and support our diverse programs. Our coalition is expanding, joined by businesses and labor unions, school districts and colleges, all recognizing the vital importance of childcare. I am committed to relentlessly advocating locally and federally for policies and funding that elevate our childcare system and the many lives it touches. I invite you to be part of this transformative endeavor too. Together, let's build a future where every child in Washington State is nurtured with high quality care and early learning, laying a solid foundation for a stronger, more equitable society. Hey. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, um, so um, next off, uh, we're gonna have uh, a couple great um, um, folk, the parents. Um, speak on behalf of uh, parents pay for minor children. Um, and, oh, I see Emily's hand up. Hi, Emily. Um, <clears throat> just a quick question in the chat, in the um, question and answer, I thought maybe it could be answered um, now before we move into the next yeah. speaker. Um, so if 53% of children and adults with disabilities are living with parents, and or relatives, where are the other 47% living? Are there spaces available in rural um, areas or communities across the state? That's a really good question. So the other part, uh, they, they live in various settings. Some of them may be in adult family homes. About 
There's about 2,000 adults that are living in adult family homes. Um, there's a large group of folks that are living in supported living, and that varies. In some cases, that could be three people in a home. Sometimes it's a person in a an apartment living by themselves that's getting support. Um, and that's probably the larger bulk of things. Um, there are some still some folks that are living in solas and, you know, um, we do have some, you know, a number of folks that are still living in our RHCs as well. But um, I would say the bulk are probably in um, supported living and um, residential services. And those are available across the state, but there are some places that there's not enough, uh, especially in rural area areas. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of those things that we always have to be advocating for is that there's enough um, adequate housing and supports across the state. Okay, so is it, it's actually Tracy yeah. up next. That was my bad. Yeah, that's good. Um, Hey, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? I'm Tracy Hoppus, and I actually uh, am a parent of uh, an adult son who experiences intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, I live in Yakima, but I also manage the Washington State uh, Parent to Parent Network and involved with uh, the Developmental Disability Council's Informing Families Project. So I am here today to talk with you about both of those family networks and some exciting work that, that we are doing right now. Uh, so we uh, currently have a legislative proviso in the amount of $400,000 to support those two family networks, parent to parent and informing families. As I said, I work with both programs on a daily basis and see the positive impacts they make with local families. And I wanna underscore local families because these are statewide projects, but they have folks working in communities with families in communities. So they understand the needs of those families and they understand the local resources as well as the state and federal resources. Uh, so I wanna talk with you a little bit first about the parent to parent network. Um, this is a network of 50 plus parent coordinators who work out of 27 programs throughout our state. We're grateful to DDA, Developmental Disabilities Administration, for providing base funding for our programs through the ARC of Washington, uh, but that amount is rarely increased. In the last five years, parent to parent has nearly quadrupled the number of parent and caregiver connections, providing more than 77,000 connections for support and information during this last year, 22-2023. We're working really hard to meet the growing and diverse needs of families, including those living in rural areas and multicultural families whose first language is not English we need additional support. Parent to Parent is doing hard work every day. These coordinators, they're supporting other families. They're also, as I said, parents and family members themselves raising their own children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In addition to Parent to Parent, the other network is uh, the Informing Families Project, again, part of the Washington State Developmental Disabilities Council uh, in partnership with the Developmental Disabilities Administration. And that includes a team of 12 local coordinators who are providing current trusted news and information uh, to families raising children with developmental disabilities. There are also three multicultural coordinators serving the Somali and Vietnamese communities in the greater Seattle area and the Spanish speaking community in Yakima County. All coordinators share feedback and firsthand knowledge of what local families are experiencing as they navigate complicated systems such as DDA or SSI. And they provide input 
into the development of resource bulletins, a monthly newsletter, and the Informing Families website. This funding would provide a boost for both networks so that ongoing support and information can be provided again at the local level. So that is really key. We are fortunate in Washington State to have support for these uh, networks. Um, we are really unique across the entire country. Uh, so putting parents and family members in leadership roles in the communities so they can hear from parents, they can support parents, and they can lift um, the challenges and issues that families are facing as they are working so hard to ensure that their kids with disabilities have the supports and services that they need. And that is all I have for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much for all the work you do. Thank you for joining us today. I work under the parent to parent um, umbrella, so I'm very familiar. <laughs> Those families work hard, I'm telling you. <laughs> Thank you, Tanika. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Thanks again for joining us today and sharing out information about parent to parent. Um, so now we are going to speak over us. Uh, pass over to those speakers Taylor was talking about. Um, we are gonna hear about the parent pay for minor children from, from Whitney and Katie. Are you both here? This is Whitney, I am here. I'm here as well. All right, awesome, over to you. Okay, um, I'm gonna kick this off and just kind of give a little bit of overview of the issue. And then Katie is going to um, talk about where we are right during session. And I apologize for my background noise of children. Um, so in Washington currently, um, when an individual is assessed personal care hours through DDA, um, the parent caregivers of those who are adults um, for their adult children um, can serve as that provider. Um, they can fulfill those personal care hours and they can be paid for those hours. Um, currently in Washington state, uh, the parent caregivers of those who are under 18, who are also assessed hours, cannot fill those hours. They cannot be paid. Um, the problem, of course, is that we know nationwide and in our state as well, um, there is a terrible shortage of caregivers, um, of professional caregivers, of nurses, of other people, non-family members that can come in and fill those hours. Uh, we also know that a lot of parents want to fill those hours. They want to be the primary caregiver. They feel that they are, um, you know, the best providing care for their child. Um, however, because they can't um, be paid for those hours, they um, leave their jobs. Uh, the family loses income. Uh, those parents don't have things like benefits or retirement or anything that would um, kind of come with a uh, job or paid employment. And so the idea um, is that we need to expand this paid parent program so that parents of minor children can be paid and compensated for fulfilling those personal care hours in the same way that caregivers of adult children um, can be paid. Um, and so that I will pass over to Katie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Whitney. Hi, my name is Katie Scheid and I am the unpaid caregiver for my daughter. Uh, she requires complete care and due to the lack of caregivers, I had to leave my job in 2021 to be her caregiver. Raising a family on a single income in the Seattle area is close to impossible. So this issue matters a great deal to me personally and to so many families like mine who constantly struggle to access the services they already qualify for. A group of parent advocates gathered together at the end of last session and began working towards a bill that would change the laws in Washington state to allow parents of minors to be paid for the Medicaid personal care hours that their child already qualifies for. From these parent advocacy efforts, House Bill 2184 was presented to the legislature this session about 30 days ago. Parents gave heartfelt testimony to the legislature three weeks ago and then again yesterday in support of this policy change. The House bill was voted unanimously out of committee, but unfortunately afterwards, a $150 million fiscal note was attached to it. And that's gonna require 112 new full-time employees for DDA and adding 1,200 new waiver costs to the system. 
We're devastated by this. We don't agree with it. And we worry that if it's not amended quickly, it's going to sink this bill altogether, especially during this short session where time is of the essence. We have legislators and stakeholders working hard to find a compromise, and we hope it will be voted out of the Appropriations Committee by February 5th, and if not, the bill will die. If you want to stay informed about this bill, you have questions about it, or you want to join the advocacy effort, um, we want to ask you to reach out to me or Whitney directly and consider joining our Facebook group which is called Parents Empowering Parents of Washington. And um, yeah, we hope that you will get more information there and join the effort. Uh, we believe it's way past time for Washington to join the majority of other states that already pay parent providers of children. For example, all our neighboring states and the entire West Coast already do this. Unfortunately, Washington has some big hurdles to overcome, but we're confident that we will get there and we would love to have you join our effort. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, Whitney. Um, I have kind of been seeing your work on social media kind of progress, and I just think that it's awesome just to see um, strong parents, moms advocating. Um, so I really appreciate all the hard work you do and, um, and really hoping for a good outcome and compromise there for that bill to move forward. Um, so next up, uh, Jim, what we have, Jill, Jim Wellman, is Jim here um, to talk about day services? Uh, Taylor, uh, I think we oh. switched the order of the agenda a little bit. Oh, I'm there was skipping. a change made last I minute. Keep, <laughs> I keep skipping. I don't know why I keep skipping. Yes. Uh, S -s Never mind. So sorry about that. We're going to talk about safety supports in the home with uh, my fellow parent coalition coordinators, um, Michelle and Sandy. Sandy. So uh, let's welcome them. And uh, I can guarantee you'll, you'll benefit out of hearing what they have to say, because these are very also very strong moms. Thanks, Taylor. Um, I recognize a lot of you here, a lot of friends. Um, my name is Sandy Gruberg. And I too am the parent of um, two adults. One of them is a client of DDA and has developmental and intellectual disabilities. And I am her uh, primary paid caregiver. And uh, for my job, in addition to that, which is pretty much a full-time job, I work for Pierce County Coalition for Developmental Disabilities, which is a family advocacy organization. And I co-chair the Parent Coalition statewide um, with Michelle Williams, and you'll hear from Michelle in a few minutes here about what parent coalitions do and how you can get involved. So I am going to um, read this off because I tend to get distracted. Um, this is my daughter here. Say hi, Marina. Oh. Hi, you got a cut on your finger? Okay, I'll help you in just a hi, minute. You cut it? Okay. Oh, this is why safety support is very necessary. I'm in here. She's in there. She just cut her hand because um, I wasn't with her to help her. So anyway, I wanted to just um, remind us that we're talking about family support needs today and um, talking specifically about family caregivers and those like myself and like Whitney talked about that we are really the primary support paid or unpaid for our loved ones. And we know we heard a statistic that 53% of adults with IDD live with their families. I'd say that's probably even higher when we include um, people under the age of 18. And that's because they've either chosen to or because other options are inaccessible or unavailable, or they just don't exist in the area as Kathy and Stacy had alluded to earlier. So I'm going to talk about safety support. And you know, you just saw an example of that. It was not staged, I promise you. Um, when an individual lives away from their family in an adult family home or a SOLA or supported living, some of those things that Kathy just talked about, part of that person's support plan includes a caregiver being available on site should safety needs occur. Uh, such safety needs could be something like accompanying someone on a walk when an individual risks getting lost without help, waiting with someone for a bus, making sure they get on the right bus and get off the right bus, 
uh, supporting someone with safety in daily activities, like whatever my daughter was doing out there that I wasn't watching, and having a caregiver on hand in the home to assist in emergency situations such as seizures or cooking accident accidents. For many individuals in residential placement, uh, that kind of safety support is needed, planned, and expected and provided with pay. However, when an individual who uses DDA supports lives in the family home, there's no paid safety support. The only in-home support given to someone living in the family home is a few hours a day of personal care tasks, such as teeth brushing, dressing, meal prep, cooking, and limited respite um, that can occur inside the home or outside the home. Families are then expected to provide safety support without pay. And even if the home giver is not, or home caregiver is not the parent, say we hire someone else, there are no paid safety support hours available to another professional care provider, just those personal care tasks. So this results in a few points of crisis that we've heard from families and individuals. Uh, one, family care caregivers must leave the workforce to provide unpaid care in the home. You heard that from Whitney and Katie. Parents must self-pay another provider out of pocket to cover the hours the state doesn't provide. Or, um, as was suggested to me, and we're not going this route because I will do this for free if I have to, but I'd rather not. Um, an individual must leave their family home where they've lived their entire lives and go to a more restrictive residential setting, such as an adult family home. So people's needs do not change across settings. If safety support is needed when someone is being served in an AFH, a SOLA or supported living settings, then paid safety support is also needed when an individual lives at home. Those supports need to follow that person no matter where they live. So safety support right now is not attached to a bill, probably why you haven't heard a lot about it, but it's something that families and advocates are working on exploring in the interim to ensure that family caregivers and their loved ones have their needs met at home instead of in a more restrictive environment. So I want to um, you know, welcome questions for later in the Q&A, but also pass this to Michelle to talk about parent coalitions and, and why we understand these needs and why we hear these needs from families. Hi, thank you, Sandy. I'm Michelle Williams and um, I'm a parent coalition coordinator here in Ellensburg in Kittitas County in the middle of the state. Um, and I just want to echo what Sandy just said. Um, and it's to me, um, the supports are all about why, why does the person's assessment, which would give on some people, not everyone, obviously, but some people do need 24 seven safety supports and they get it over here but suddenly here, they don't. It's like, why Why, in their choice of where they wanna live, does the assessment suddenly change? So I, it's for me, it's all about the parity. If somebody assesses this level of hours here, it should be here as well. So all about equity for the person and their assessment. Um, parent Coalition, I love Parent Coalition. I'm also a parent to parent coordinator, so I understand parent to parent. Um, we're all, parents and family members, and we work our darndest to try and understand these systems and educate um, other families about the systems. And it's all about advocacy. And I'm, I'm rambling now. I'm, I just got so, so <laughs> emotional about parity, parity of services. Um, but parent coalitions, we're statewide. We are not in every single county, but we do cover the state. We all have our individual contracts. They are not the same, but they have similar things that we need to do. We educate, we advocate, we system navigate, all about families, and we are very local. So we bring together amongst ourselves what is actually happening with these systems for our family members. Do they work? Why don't they work? What are the gaps? And we bring that together and we present it to our legislators, we present it to our school boards, we present it to whoever is working with these systems for our people and try to create solutions that can actually work. Um, because I, when I read the guiding values of DDA, they are beautiful, but it's not quite filtering down to actually work 
person-centered in the community, accessible, whatever the person needs within the you know, parameters of what DDA can do. It's really, it's just not filtering down there in the way that it should. Um, and we're trying to bring that information forward because we are in the trenches working diligently to get that what our, what our people deserve, um, a life in this world, um, equitable with everything they need to be able to do whatever they want. And I know this is a big dream, but it is what I want. My, my son is in this world. He deserves to be in this world and he deserves it in a way that he doesn't have to beg for services. So that's Parent Coalition. If you want to know any information about how to start a Parent Coalition, if there's not one in your area, please contact Sandy or myself. We'll put our information in the chat. Um, but we try to do the good work and let everybody know what's really happening on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Sandy and Michelle. Those were amazing stories. I just wanted to pause to see if there was um, anything in the Q&A for Sandy or Michelle before we go on to our next speakers. Um, um, not in, not about what has been said um, by the previous speakers. There's just a question about um, the, the um, new employees um of DDA that is part of the um parent caregiver um issue and um and so there's I'm just been um corresponding back and forth with um someone who is um a bit confused about that um and the need for more employees related to DDA when you're when you're talking about the parent um caregiver issue so um yeah I can take a stab at that this is Katie Scheid talking again sure. um yes you bring up a very good question um this was just a simple policy change it was a bill that just asked DDA to just check a box on a waiver that would allow LRIs or legally responsible individuals to be paid caregivers that's for uh, parents of minors, as far as um, government speak goes. Um, it'd be the same as if suddenly 4,000 caregivers entered the workforce tomorrow and we could utilize all our hours. It would be the same thing. We're just asking parents to be eligible caregivers. Um, and so we don't understand why 112 FTEs were added to this bill. Um, we think, because they didn't actually give an explanation in the fiscal note of why, we believe it's because they will now need to check on families four times a year instead of just once to make sure they're not abusing their child, um, which we think is ludicrous because why would we not be checked on when we're getting no services at all? Why now that parents get a little bit of support for caring for their children, they now need to be checked on. Um, so that was one reason uh, DDA gave of why they needed all these new employees. And they also are adding kids onto waivers um, that aren't on waivers. And we're not sure where these kids are coming from. They quoted 1,000 kids in the fiscal note. And I can't find those 1,000 kids in the DDA caseload. So we're trying to get to the bottom of that number, but they say 1,000 kids that currently qualify for personal care would now become eligible for DDA waivers. We're not really sure what that means, um, but that cost is being factored in, as well as 200 kids that they're going to find um, somewhere and add onto waivers as well. I think they're thinking now maybe 200 kids that currently don't want to be signed up with DDA would now want to be signed up because their parent could be paid. Um, but I think that's just a guess. Um, they don't have that 200 number to, to show. So it's a lot of fuzzy math going on. Um, and we're trying to get to the bottom of that. Tana Sen, who we heard in the video at the beginning, has been going to bat for us, fighting this, trying to get an, a fiscal note that could be realistic to actually pass. Um, but sorry, that was probably more information than you wanted, but that is my best attempt at answering why 112 FTEs would ever be needed for this simple uh, bill. Um, so thank you so much, Katie. That's 
that's hugely helpful for the person. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Let's see, Michelle, did you have a question? Thank you. I just didn't know what FTE stands for. Full-time employees. So the employees, they were, they're saying they're going to have to hire 112 employees to pay about 5,000 new paid, unpaid caregivers. Yeah. And the then, number of, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Yes. The number of unused hours was 1.5 million hours back in 2022. So we're using those numbers. Um, and so is DDA. Um, so that adds up to $25.5 million in state funds per year that go unused. And that money is actually being counted in this fiscal note. We're going to need to ask for that money back to be, even though it's already budgeted and allocated, it's being included in this fiscal note as being money that we need to ask for again. Because they've gotten, basically they... They use it for other things because it has gone unused for so long. But they're going to check on all these parents who are getting paid now. That's because the, yes. Yep. And we as parents do not agree with this at all. Um, we do believe safeguards need to be in place for all people with, who are receiving services, um, whether their parent is paid or not. But we do not believe that the safeguards that they are billing on this is um, is fair, is wanted, is warranted. Yeah. Oh, there so, are, yeah. yeah. So, so, so somehow now we're taking advantage of the system because we want to be paid. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You got it. I got it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for answering that, Katie. Appreciate you. All right, and uh, Sandy and Michelle did put their contact info in the chat um, for if you'd like to get in contact with them. And then please just check the chat. There's a lot of good information. There's a lot of good links in there um, about topics that we're covering. Um, so James, Jim, we see you. He's been ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Jim Wellman. Thank you for joining us today. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Jim Weldon. I live in Gig Harbor and I have a 21 year old daughter named Grace who has intellectual disabilities. Uh, I'm a retired businessman and for the past year, a new parent advocate focused mainly on ways to bring more constructive and meaningful activities during the daytime to adults with significant IDD who are isolated in their homes or need more to do with their time. A year ago, this is a bit of a personal story, a year ago, our as our daughter was about to finish her school to work program, it really sunk in how the program activities that had enabled her to achieve so much personal growth, social engagement and preparation for work and other community engagement were about to end. So we as a family faced that cliff that most families have probably experienced, that school to couch transition. I spoke with some other parents whose families are aging out of the program and most were in a state of shock. Uh, trying to figure out how to restructure family life to provide the extensive support needed by their loved ones. So how do you keep working? You know, what if you're a single parent? What if your child has challenging behavioral support needs that you don't feel you can handle alone? Well, most families have children that finish school, become independent and leave home. I realized that when our children with significant IDD age out of the school system, that society and our communities and our state government largely rely on us to replace supports that may be needed for years or a lifetime. So I started thinking about what I could do about that. And after looking into programs around the country and locally for ideas and models and talking with lots of people, I saw examples of good solutions, but also recognized one large obstacle. Nearly all the existing programs are largely funded through private donations and fees paid by families. Program costs are quite high due to the personal care support requirements. And as such, these services are not broadly available outside of wealthier communities. The question 
for me became how to make the right services available to more people that need them regardless of financial needs and across a much broader geography. And that pointed me in the direction of public funding. I realized that private funding was not a solution. Somehow we were going to need some public funds for these kinds of services. That led me to study the DDA administered Medicaid services. And I realized there just isn't much available in the way of daytime services for people living with their families. Our state is committed in law to provide necessary to support to enable people with IDE to be engaged and included in the community alongside people without disabilities. And it has a commitment to, pro to, to help people find employment is, is one of its primary means of doing that. But for people who are not employed, the state offers community engagement and community inclusion service to a much lesser extent, but these are just not enough. There's just not enough hours uh, in a week being provided through these services. Our own daughter was fortunate to find competitive paid work from the age of 18 and now has two jobs plus some volunteer work. She's a bit unique. She thrives in a work environment setting where she's embraced, but she is one of the lucky ones. And even she needs more. Statistically of the 20,000 adults that receive paid DDA services, three quarters are not working at all. And the other quarter are working an average of only 11 hours a week. So more meaningful activities are needed to fill the gaps in people's days and help them continue to grow emotionally and vocationally so that they can become more independent, self-confident, and more engaged in the community. Appropriate personal supports are needed to enable participation that does not depend on family caregivers providing transportation and personal care. People need a choice of daytime activities and their choices should be part of a robust person-centered planning process that takes into account their current goals and support needs. To achieve these critical objectives, there's a lot of work to be done. From recent experience, I'm encouraged that things are starting to move in the right direction after what I'm told have been many years with little or no progress. To move forward with new and expanded services to enable people to have more meaningful days we need a broad coalition of support across the state and across stakeholder groups. And that has to begin with a common understanding of what good programs and services look like and even what bad ones look like. So we're aligned on goals. That alignment is critical. So we're all pulling in the same direction and to increase our influence with agencies and the legislature. The most difficult challenge we will, will be getting Washington State and the federal Medicaid system to provide greater funding. Washington ranks quite low in how much it spends on day services. It is highly unlikely that funding will be quickly available to meet the needs of every person who should be eligible for services, but it's important that we make a start. Your continued advocacy on behalf of all needed services, not just day services, is critical. The more active voices we have, the more influence we will have with DDA, the legislature, and other agencies that we need to provide for our loved ones and for our family caregivers' needs. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, uh, Jim. I, I appreciate that. I just wanted to add in real quickly, I also work for a day program part-time here in Spok Spokane County at the Arc of Spokane. In fact, one of my directors for that program is here um, attending, I think. Um, so um, it is it is important that day services are also, we get the ball rolling on that, I agree. Even if we don't see it pass a session, it would, it would be nice to see it push through and it gets some attention or some type of funding. So I just really appreciate you sharing that because it really is a meaningful, it's really meaningful to the mem members and participants of those day programs as well as their families. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so, um, and if I got it right this time, Mike Gantall is next. So hopefully I didn't skip anybody this time, but, um, but yeah, I'm just, uh, Mike's next and, uh, and Mike has been a part of, uh, advocacy days for a while now, as well as other self advocacy organizations. So oh, yeah, I just, uh, no, Mike, you're, you're, you're loved. You're, 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 you're awesome. And I'm always excited. I, just, to here. I, I, I was listening to all these stories that all this is getting me teared up. I hope I can get to my speech before I get to it. I'm going to read, um, what was given to me by 
my friend and co-worker, Sean Michael, he just helped me in this situation. And um, my name is Mike Dentoto. I'm a client. My parents are my caregivers. Um, and my twin brother is my caregiver as well. Um, they helped me um, get out of bed. Um, as you can see, yeah, I am in my living room, my bedroom right now. Um, they do help me uh, transfer because I have cerebral palsy, which is my other half, my bottom half does not work as well as some people in school. Um, so I need a wheelchair all, I'm in a wheelchair all the time. I do have another one in case I, I need it. Um, the, the, the family supports, they do help me transfer. They help me get, um, let's see. They help me transfer I been and do my make sure I get ready for my day. Um the and they may make sure I get uh, well I'll get to that in just a second. Um they do take me to my um I have to go to Seattle monthly, um, not every month, but every three months, I'll be just every three months. Um, it's my mom and my dad are taking me to my appointments at least four times a month. And they get the entire caregivers get 110 miles a month, let me take a look. Um, that does not mean my dad gets 110. That means the entire house gets 10, 110. We need more. Um, because I, I, we're on trip. I do have to mention this. We're on trip. It is 93 miles from here. I do live in Monroe, which is southeast of Everett. So that's an hour and a half, at least an hour and a half, if I would get lucky. Um, um, let's see. I need, um, well, on trip, well, let me see. Uh, I also have family members that need caregiving um, breaks, breaks. They need breaks um, because I am 24 seven. They're not here right now, but um, they're outside doing stuff, but I do need I do have my phone with me at all times um, for that reason. Um, I, I, I do have uh, volunteer jobs outside this household, which um, two of them, one of them is almost is it 21 years. I started that out of high school, out of blink of my eye. The other one is 13 years. Um, so it's been um, very, it's not easy um, doing without those supports. I would not be doing what I've been doing. 
the reason I can't stay long, I stay about three hours, at least three hours outside this house. The reason I can't get a, a paid employment is because I have to deal with it. Um, I have to deal with the, uh, I have to deal with the restroom issue. Um, I, I do I do get support from my jobs, but um, I can't stay long because of the bathroom issue. Um, because I, I have to come home, use the restroom, and then I can go back out. Um, the, the, yeah, that's mostly what I have to deal with. If I did not have the supports, like I said before, I would be way right over there in that bed 24 seven. And I, I speak this to my, um, I'm also on the board of Allies in the Advocacy. Uh, the director is here on this call right now. I'm also the co-chair of SAIL as of December 12th. Um, I do a lot of those. And I'm a member, a member of People First. But the one thing I will never forget and the if Demis is here, uh, Demis, uh, he, um, I am also part of SEI. I'm uh, the client of SEIU, which is the caregiver part of it. Um, without my mom, or my dad, or my brother, or anyone else in my family, I would not be doing all of this including Sean Langham, which is all my support, Emily Rogers, sorry. Um, without those people and all the, I'm also on the um, uh, community summit uh, meetings with Kathy, Kathy and Sean. Um, so without these supports, please don't let these supports go. We need more caregivers as it goes, because like like everyone else is insane. Not my mother, and this is coming from those caregivers. Won't just, my parents are aging as I as well as I. Um, I'm not getting any younger, <laughs> and I, they're not getting any younger either. So we need to make sure the as many caregivers as as some of these parents have been saying, and I've been listening, that we need caregivers to be there when our parents are, can't do this anymore. And that's my fear of when my parents can't do it anymore, what, what, if, what, what am I gonna do? Please don't let this go through. Please let this go through and pay your caregivers as much as they need. Thank, thank you, Mike. <laughs> thank you. Mike, thanks for speaking. You're a great advocate. Well, I've done this for all my adult life, so it's not easy that somebody has to make sure it's getting done. Thanks for sharing your story, Mike. Mike is everywhere. I think he said to me one time, Tanika is everywhere. Mike is everywhere. Yeah. Advocating all the time. I think yeah. the last um, time I saw Mike, he was getting a, was it advocate of the year or lifetime advocate award the last time I saw Mike. So thank you so much for, for sharing your story and for all the hard work you do. Well, somebody has to do it. <laughs> That's right. We got Mike. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. No problem. All right. And I believe I saw Demas. Yes. So we are going to go ahead and move over. And I'm going to pass the mic on to Demas. And he's here to talk about the workforce. Thanks for joining us today, Demas. Thank you. I do apologize uh, for being late. Uh, 
Thank you very much for having me here, guys. Uh, my name is Dimas Nestorenko. I am a legislative and policy manager with SAU 775. We represent long-term care providers in the state of Washington, Montana, and Alaska now. And plus, we also represent nursing home workers. Um, as Mike said, uh, we are experiencing a uh, workforce shortage in the long-term care industry, not just in our states, uh, just overall uh, through the country. Uh, and it's explanation is really easy. It's not an easy job. Uh, um, um, as uh, I myself a caregiver, I take care of my sister who I adopted. She's technically my, on, on paper, she's my daughter, but she's my younger sister. Um, and I do know what it is caregiving uh, day to day, uh, what, what it takes to provide care. And it's uh, it's not an easy job. So uh, we are working on several projects. And one of the projects we are, I'd like to talk about uh, providing uh, health care access to nursing home workers. Why nursing home workers and why we talk about health care access? What we notice um, our home care providers who provide in-home care services uh, through the state, they do have a really great benefits. I'm not sure if you have friends or someone you can ask those questions with a caregiver through the uh, state of Washington and if they have health care benefits. And Tanika, I'm sure you can also vouch for me how great those benefits are. Um, I know some of the folks become caregivers because of those benefits. I know it's sad to say that a health care, unfortunately, is privileged in this country. Um, and not everyone has access and luckily uh, work uh, like caregiving will get, will get provides access to health care and dental care. Unfortunately, nursing home facilities in a different uh, in a different they have a completely different story. They do not have this health care access, even if the employer offered them access. Uh, plans are usually expensive with high deductibles and uh, quite often they can't even use it because it's a deductible $10,000. And if you need to see a doctor, it means you have to pay out of your packet, unfortunately. We proposed legislation this year, and I'm going to be honest right away. So it's this bill most likely not going to pass uh, because it's a short session um, supplemental budget. And we knew it's not going to go uh, far away, but we just started a conversation. So this bill would create a healthcare trust for nursing home workers in our state. Similar to the, the trust we have right now for loan for caregivers. What it would do, it would help to stabilize our workforce because um, wages is one thing. We can provide good wages, but also if there's not good benefits, it doesn't uh, encourage uh, workers to stay in same workforce. And unfortunately, nursing home facility is struggling, extremely struggling, and especially after the pandemic, uh, a lot of them had to shut down their businesses because they can just maintain workers. And not just they just don't pay them well if, they can make the same money with say going to work at Starbucks or somewhere else at the store and not to deal with difficulties of this workforce. So by providing healthcare benefits, I think it's one of the one of the key uh, to help maintain workforce and encourage uh, 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 workers to stay in uh, nursing home uh, facilities to provide care. Um, another thing, we are working on increasing wages uh, for our caregivers, and every other year we negotiate uh, contracts and make sure that caregivers uh, get uh, fair wages. Right now, our, our caregivers start our wage, wages at over $21 an hour, and uh, which is... Uh, comparison to the rest of the country is the highest wages. I'm not saying this is enough, and especially if you live in Seattle, it means it's not enough to support family. If you are a single parent that try to provide care, that uh, it means you have to have more than one job, unfortunately. And um, we're still doing uh, what we can on our end uh, to uh, negotiate with lawmakers, and, but also with uh, uh, communities that we need to pro we need to uh, we need make legislators understand the force to sustain the force we have to pay better wages and not paying uh, great wages it doesn't it, folks just going to go and try to get a job somewhere else because again. Caregiver is not an easy, and if especially care for someone uh, and it's not family related, it's it's not an easy job. 
And I know a lot of uh, workers uh, do this job because they enjoy, but also they have a heart to provide care. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's their call. And I know so many members in our union who dedicated themselves to this profession. And on top of it, we're also um, creating uh, the caregiving as a profession. It's uh, not just someone who stabbies and make food or someone. It's it's that's the person who's a first responder who's going to identify if the, uh, my client needs to go to hospital or my client needs to see some doctor or what what I need to do because I'm a first responder in this case. I'm the first one who's going to identify is something wrong with my client. Should I do something different or should I uh, schedule an appointment? So it's something we we tr we, pr we try to provide uh, ongoing education for our caregivers and based on this case, who they work with. And so uh, this is a short session. We don't have a lot going on because usually we try to get a lot of uh, uh, projects uh, on the lo longer session, not a supplemental budget, but still we're doing uh, what we can on our end, uh, make sure we meet uh, work for shortage crisis. And it's something that legislation also express that one of their top of agenda this year and the next year is going to be uh, work for shortage for essential services, including nursing home and long-term care providers. I think it's going to be crucial in a few years that we sustain this workforce and uh, at least we can give provide benefits for those workers because I think they do deserve to have healthcare healthcare access. I think everyone should have a healthcare access. It should be privileged. It should be dependent on if your employer offers benefits or not. It should you should nobody should think do I can afford to go see a doctor and so I can take care of myself. It shouldn't be a question. You should everyone should just I did see a doctor and go see a doctor without thinking how much it's going to cost me. Unfortunately, we live in different reality, but with you. Your help with uh, being your allies as well and um, being your partner. I hope we can pass this together. Yeah, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for having me here. Back to you, Tanika. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Demas? And you can wave at me too if you if you can't if you're not technically inclined. And yes, I can talk a lot to healthcare. I won't tell you how long I've been doing that because then y'all will guess my age. But I've been very lucky to have SEIU 775 and do a lot of advocating with uh, Dima. So I know a lot about uh, that. Oh, I'll, I'll say something. Go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, my question, main question, and maybe a comment is that yes, we are shortage of caregivers. But the the but what and I agree that they need some sort of health care to help them out because right now that's what we're short of. We need making sure we have enough health care workers. But how can we be able to promote that so that if I say because our family is aging and we need to make sure that hey do we have any other backup systems in 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 a sense to help saying hey what what's next. Um, do, who, how they're going to be able to pass it one generation to the next generation if, for a person that might need that extra help. And Mike, you did a great job. And I can answer this question. I think it's, uh, um, if I have time. Um, so the, the best way you can help right now, if you have a chance to talk to your legislator, make sure you express this and mention the bill is uh, 2351, which is uh, provides healthcare access. Let me just double check I'm giving you because I've been working with so many bills. I want to make sure. Yes, 2351, the bill number, and, and it's scheduled for hearing actually today, uh, uh, healthcare committee. If you have time until 30 sign on and support, it would really help just to show um, um, support uh, to legislators. If you don't mind, uh, I Tanika, I, can I drop a link so if folks have ability to right now go and sign on and yes, support? Of course, yes. It would be really great uh, for, for legislators see support for other organizations because Thank you. Something it's uh, holds up leg legislators because it's cost a lot of money to start, but also we need to keep in mind that there's a federal match. So if state is going to uh, 
invest 10 million, it means another 10 million will come from the federal government, which is something we need to keep in mind that they are, it, it would help to build the healthcare trust for those workers. And eventually it's something they can, it, it would help to provide sustained workforce and help people to stay in the same uh, for workforce to provide care. Because unfortunately there's not many solution left. I'm going to send the li uh, the link uh, in the chat again. Thank you very much uh, for um, for helping us. All right. Any more questions? One question in the chat is: the primary pay for caregivers coming from Medicaid, Medicare, or insurance companies? Medicaid. Medicaid. Yes. And. Uh, Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost exclusively. I think to add that what Kathy said is correct, what Stephen said is correct, but one thing is for sure, I'm the boss. <laughs> okay. You're the boss. That's, that's clear. The client is the, the boss. I'm not going to fire my own parents, but yes, for those who don't know, we are the boss of the caregivers. We make sure they get paid. Great. And for the hours that I get or anyone else gets on this call, it comes from the client hours. Thank you. Hey. All right, over you, Taylor. All right. If there's um, there's lots of like a like Tanika mentioned, there's lots of great info in the chat. Uh, Katie Shy just put um, something in the ch in the chat um, regarding uh, House Bill twenty one eighty four. If you want to look look at that, um, there's a lot in there, so I'm not going to repeat it. But uh, but yeah, there's a lot um, of great info in the chat. Um, and oh, someone just, yeah, um, that's right, Mike, you're the boss. Um, of your, of your, um, the, the client is the boss. Um, but yeah, it, um, and I, we, we save the chat and just remind everyone, and it's also recorded. So, um, and then if there's any questions, uh, we can uh, refer them to the speakers or anyone here helping uh, host. Oh, there's another Q&A that just popped in. Let us see. All right. I think this one might've just got answered, but I don't know. Um, is the primary pay for caregivers coming from, oh, that's, sorry, it just popped up. Um, it literally just popped up. So um, that already got answered. Anyway, if there's no more questions, um, we're gonna move on to uh, bills and budgets um, and Kathy, will go, we'll go over that, so. All right, here we go. So, um, just a second, let me pull this all over so you can see. Are you all able to see that now? Can yes. you see it, Taylor? Okay, perfect. Um, so tomorrow is what we call cutoff day, or let's see, no, today is cutoff day. <laughs> <laughs> I missed a day. Um, and um, by, by later to the, this evening, I think at five o'clock, if a bill hasn't gotten through what we call the committee of origin and in and moved over to a fiscal committee, you know, that's the money committee, then, you know, bill, we'll see a lot of bills dying. So to not today, we're going to look at there's still a lot of bills out there uh, by tomorrow. It's going to shrink a whole lot. So let's get started and let's kind of go through. I'm not going to talk about every single bill, but I'm just going to give some highlights here. Um, the um, In housing, we have 2276 and 6191 that increases the supply of affordable and workforce housing. Those bills are both in finance committees, so that's good. One's in finance and the other's in ways and means, so it's going to make it through the cutoff which is good. Um, they both had hearings. That's about supplying, um, creating a revenue source for DD housing. It's got 
15% set aside for DD housing. Um, let's see, I'm going to skip a couple of these because I don't know much about them. The employment standards for individual provider bill, that looks like it's got a hearing. It had a hearing yesterday, um, and then its companion was referred to appropriation, so that one's still moving along. Um, and I think the same um, with the individual provider definition, it had a hearing, um, but I don't know if it has made it through. It, it has moved, excuse me, to ways and means, so that means it's one of those bills is still alive will be um let's see the resident this bill 15 1859 we understand as of yesterday it got pulled and it is um did not have an executive session so it's not going to move along um let's see there's a couple of bills around um inpatient um, support for young adults. Um, I think those are all moving along. So there's the parent pay of minors, 2184 and 6267. Um, they they are, um, you know, it, the one was referred to appropriations. Well, it'll need to have a hearing, so that's good. Um, so you heard more about that bill earlier. So if that's important to you, you can take action on that. Um, the respite bill, the, the Senate version has an executive session. Oh, and that's the wrong color. Sorry about that. Um, today at 1.30. So if that's important to you, you want may want to listen in and see what happens with that bill to see if it gets moved on. The um, Senate bill actually um, moved along to ways and means. So that bill's moving. Um, waiver prioritization, it did get, it's today also has an executive session. So we can hear whether that bill's gonna move to a fiscal committee or not. That bill tells DDA how to prioritize waivers when they have excess waivers. Um, and it talks about people that are in hospitals, people coming out of RHCs. And it also talks about um, senior families, which I think is really important. And it's often a group that is not um, recognized. So we're hoping that maybe it will move along. It's, um, Representative Farivar has worked on that for us. There's a little bill around ASL interpretation work group for protactile sign language interpreters. That's moving along. Um, crisis relief centers, they've got a public hearing in Ways and Means. Um, a couple of these are just bills that were reintroduced and are probably not going anywhere. Um, we listened in on this bill. So I think you see that we, we changed this to a smiley face. 1941 um, is a bill about care for medically complex children, and it's about the coordination of care. And from what we understand, it's a way to tap into some additional match from the federal government Medi for Medicaid for to help coordinate care for children who are medically complex. Um, we're learning a little bit more about it. It has an executive session today, so we'll see if it moves anywhere, but that may be of interest to some of you. Um, I would think it might be interesting to some of the folks particularly that we're talking about parent pay, probably a lot of the same group of parents there. Um, the rare disease bill, I haven't heard if that's moving. It was reintroduced, but I don't think it's moving. Um, the day Habila 2080 is probably not moving because of the fiscal note. Um, but I think this is one of those things that sparked a lot of conversation and will continue to spark conversation throughout the session, the off session as well. Um, this is really cool. The 5883, the burden of proof bill, which moves the, um, well, the burden of proof from the families to the school, which is really good. Families shouldn't have to do that. Um, it is made it to rules. So that's exciting. And if you want to see it get out of rules, you might want to um, 
connect with somebody there. Um, who's I think, ever Kathy, the this is Stacey. I think it's out of rules. It's in that limbo land between rules and getting on the floor calendar is what I understand. Yeah. Uh, so we should, and I don't know why it's not notated differently, but I understand from uh, Senator Trudeau who sponsored this bill in the Senate that it's okay. She's just waiting for it to get on the floor calendar. That's which is really exciting. So you can talk about support for that um, with your legislators. Um, the infants and toddlers bill, um, the um, it has an, a hearing in appropriations, which is really good, and it's going to have an executive session on the second. So that's about a little fix for the infants and toddlers programs. ESIT. Um, there's m money. Uh, these bills are continuing. The prototypical staffing is continuing to move forward. Um, the increasing the special ed cap is referred to ways and means, which means it's moving forward, which is good. There's a bunch of bills about the cap. It looks like these two on the top are moving. Um, there it was uh, an executive session about restraint and isolation, I believe, yesterday. I haven't heard how, what the results of that are. Does Stacy or Ramona know? Hi, this is Ramona. I'm sorry, were you talking about 1479? Yes. Yes, they passed a uh, substitute bill out of out of committee. So it's okay. Still That's really good news. So you may want to help make that move forward. Um, let's see. Some of these bills are not moving. Um, this one's moving. Um, this one is kind of a, a grab bag of things for special ed. There's a bunch of stuff in it, but it's moving along. 1914, it has a bunch of different things in it. You might want to look into that if that's important to you. Um, some other bills that we aren't following quite so closely about child care. Um, Safety net funding is moving forward, uh, Bill. So extending special ed services um, to age 22, it's a little bit of a fix. It had an executive session, and I think, um, I, I'm assuming that it's moving forward, but we may need to check on that. Um, let's see. The service animal bill is moving. It was passed in the Senate. It's going to move over to the, uh, and it was on the floor, so it probably needs to move to the House, I believe. Um, the guardianship bill has a hearing in ways and means on, uh, let's see, the first, which is tomorrow, I believe. Um, and we're waiting to see, I think Sean will talk a little bit more about the nothing about us without out us bill. Um, these are just some, some other bills that we aren't following too closely about voter education, system improvement. They don't impact us a lot, but they're kind of interesting. Um, the right to repair bill, which includes wheelchairs, which was really important. It had a hearing on the 12th, but I don't think it has moved. Let's see. And then it's companion. It has a companion bill now. Um, and it also had a hearing, but I don't know if it has moved out of committee or had an executive session yet that I looked last I looked. So if that is important to you, I would connect with those, your legislators and ask to make sure that it moves forward by today. Um, also adding transit member, uh, voting members to public transit. In other words, people who actually use a service need to be on the transit committee and it's moved to um, house rules. Um, the preservation of records at RHCs. Um, it had an executive session yesterday, and I believe it moved out of it, which is good. So it will move forward. And then there, we have some provisos, um, different groups asking for money, CEA for rate increases, um, supported living CRSA around rates. Um, and then preservation of records. Um, the pres the legal aid bill for um, that the Arco Spokane was proposing, it's delayed, and they're going to work on that next year rather than this year. Um, there's also a pilot 
project around that provides professional development and consultation uh, across the state to promote um, inclusion of children with challenging behaviors and disabilities in early childhood settings. So there's some re uh, fi fiscal request for that via Northwest Center. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to play the um, video ab about how you can be involved. Excuse me, there. Uh, just one thing: Are we? Are you guys supporting House Bill twenty four to twenty two? It's a housing bill in the rural area under tax incentives to help build more effect. Uh, part of that sales tax, sales tax goes toward house toward housing, affordable housing. Twenty tw is that two that's four not the two two. Two four two two. I don't know if we're following that bill, but and but doesn't necessarily mean we're not supporting it. I think we just don't know a lot about it. So if yeah, you could get was, us more information, that would be helpful. Yeah, it's a bill just on a that helps build more ta more affordable housing in the rural areas that under amp, but the way they pay for it is through your sales and sales and use tax. Is the way it gets paid for, which is a great bill. It's a um, helps with, a, and it's like we're trying every which way to put affordable housing. It's now this is another way, and but um, through throughout for through rural county in the rural county areas. Okay, great, thanks. And if you could get us more information, that will be great. Yeah, you got it. Okay, let's watch. Um, Sean's great video. Let's see. Yep. Sorry. Got to move the. There we go. Hi, I'm Sean Latham, the policy coordinator for Self Advocates and Leadership. And I'm Jessica Renner from Self Advocates and Leadership. We want to thank everyone for taking your time out today to join us for Advocacy Days. We're here to talk to you about how to become a trusted resource for legislators on issues that affect your life. Even though your elected officials represent you, they can't do this very well if they don't know what you want. Oops. Sorry. We want to encourage you to contact your legislators throughout session, but especially this week, about the issues that matter to you. That's right. With so many topics for legislators to learn about, your knowledge of developmental disabilities helps them to do their job. You are the expert in telling your story and how it relates to decisions they are making. Here are some tips to help you make the most impact. Your time with legislators, staff or aides is short, and your message should be too. When you communicate, sum up what the issue is and why it's important to you have a specific request related to a bill or budget item attack the problem not the person follow up with a thank you by doing this you greatly increase your credibility and strengthen your legislative relationships bottom line stick to what you know which is your life and how the issue affects you here are some ways that you can reach out to your legislators you can email them and their legislative assistant about your priorities. To email your legislator, visit www.leg.wa.gov. From there, click on Communicate with a Legislator or participate in a committee hearing. Then, under Communicating with a Legislator, click Send an Email. From there, you can find and choose your representative. Click on their name, fill in your contact information, and send your message. You can contact them through the legislative hotline phone number and ask to leave a message for them. We also encourage you to request either an in-person meeting with them or a meeting over Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Please reach out to the legislative assistant and the legislator to request a meeting. You can watch the legislature at work on TVW, either on your TV, if you have the channel, or online at tvw.org. 
Another way you can participate is by signing up to testify at legislative hearings. For each hearing, you can sign up for the individual bills as pro, meaning you are for the bill, con, meaning you are against the bill, or other if you have concerns with the bill you generally like. Please remember before you speak at a hearing, note what bill you are testifying about, and be sure you know what the focus of the bill is. Let me now take you through the process using the Washington State Legislative website that can be found at leg.wi.gov. On the website under the section, Let Your Voice Be Heard, click on the button that has participate in the committee hearing on it. From there under the participating in a community hearing section, click on testifying in a committee hearing. Next choose if you testifying in a Senate hearing or House hearing. We all have the choice to testify in person. Testify by video remotely or we Hi Rosie, yeah, I'm hearing you. Are you in the wrong channel? Okay, thank you. We can submit written testimony or just state what our position is on the bill. After you pick one of the options, you will be taken to the form to register. You will need to fill out your position, your name, your email, your address, your phone number, and your organization if you are representing one. It also asks you if you will testify on a panel or not. If you are testifying on a panel, it will ask you to fill in the names of the other panelists. The other box to make note of is the pronunciation box. If you want your name said right, you can sound it out in that box. Please also check the box. I'm not a robot at the end of the form, and then it's time to hit submit registration. Once you submit your registration, you will receive an email from a committee staff email address. Please read this email carefully and add the meeting to your desired calendar using the links in the email. From there, make sure you are ready to testify. Don't forget about social media. A lot of legislators have accounts on Facebook and Twitter where you can comment or watch live stream chats and virtual town halls. It's so important to stay informed and involved. Participate in virtual advocacy days, Sign up for the ARC of Washington's Action Alerts, get updates at arcwa.org, and follow on Facebook. Connect with local parent and self-advocate groups. For more information, check out the ARC of Washington's Hot Tips publication on our advocacy page at arcwa.org, available in English or Spanish. And remember, change is made by those who show up. This is Sean. I hope you are having a great day today. First, I want to remind you again, people can now sign up to testify for a bill that is scheduled to have a hearing from the bill page on the legislative website. Therefore, you can visit your favorite bill or bills, look on the red side of the page, and if you see the button that says sign up to testify, you can click on it to go directly to the sign up page. I also wanted to say if you want to see what bills are being heard on the House and Senate floors, because it is that time now when they start passing bills, you can go to leg.wa.org. GOV. Once you are on that page, look for the prompt, what's happening on the floor? Underneath, you can click on the links for the House floor calendar and the Senate floor calendar. These links will take you to the place to see what bills are coming up for a floor vote. Please check it out. I also have a message from Zale. 
Sale encourages everyone to contact their House legislators on House Bill 1541, the Nothing About Us Without Us Act, and tell them to pull the bill from House rules for a House floor vote. Please do it as soon as possible to get this over to the Senate. Now to our one pager on how do we support families to support their loved ones. As we all know, families are the core relationships any of us will have. Families love and support each other throughout life. Due to the diverse needs of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, this support looks similar and different to other families. Like most families, parents are the primary caretaker of their children. However, this support may look different due to the unique challenges of our disability. Parents and other members of the family tend to be the ones to support us not only in childhood, but also in adulthood, because of the lack of high-quality providers and the numbers we need them. Parents of kids under 18 also have unique challenges in that they often can't work out of the home because their sons and daughters need 24-hour support. We need to support these families by paying them to assist their sons and daughters. We also need to fund respite services so that they can take breaks. We need to also encourage our state to assist us in building up more high quality providers that will assist people when family members can't anymore or when individuals want to be more independent of their families. A few other things we want to watch for this session. One, an investment to parent to parent. Two, several bills that would pay parents of minors with disabilities and provide more opportunities in the community and provide more respite support. Three, creating more safety supports in family homes. Four, and watching the digital transformation of DDA services. Four, lastly, I want to encourage you to fill out our Advocacy Day survey. This helps us understand what you like and what you didn't like about Advocacy Day, so we can get better and better. You have the option of filling out the Zoom survey that you should see on the screen now, or alternatively, you can click on the links I posted in the chat. There will be an English and Spanish link. Let us know after if you need any assistance in filling out the survey. With that, I will just say thank you everyone for attending and go advocate for your needs. That's great. Okay, I think Carrie has a question or comment. Um, I know we're over time, uh -huh. so I'll keep this very brief. Um, but Sean, thank you. Uh, what listening to you, it brought it brought to mind research I did in a, my doctoral program. And I was building a reason why we should look at parent support uh, for families. And Stacy called my attention to something that I had put into my into the work and how oftentimes we look at people with IDD from a negative standpoint. Like, of course, they are, of course, families are stressed. Of course, caregivers are stressed. It's well, of course, we are taking care of or providing care for these individuals with IDD. And Stacy kind of questioned that and also asked me to look at that. And I, when I went deeper into the literature, what I see is it's not the individual. It is actually lack of access to resources. Yeah. And it makes sense to all of us, doesn't it? But yeah. um, I thought that was exciting because it, it changed my ideas about how, and I'm only my own experience. My, I have a daughter who is 31, she lives in, uh, she's doing well in supported living. And I, I I started looking at her as an individual, what she brings to my life. And I think all of us in this community realize that either, you know, I myself have a disability or someone I love has a disability, but I think it's important that we, maybe if we figure out a way to communicate that to legislators too. We need these resources so that we are healthier and, then in turn, our lives are enriched as well as we can enrich the lives of individuals that we love. Thank you. Well said. Thank you, Carrie. And thank you for putting all that in info in the chat as well. Um, 
the chat was booming, so I couldn't keep up with it too much, but no, I thank you for all that insight. Um, oh, Robert, did you have a question? My, my question is that a house bill 23, whatever it was, about that the guy was talking about. Oh. 2351. Yeah. And Demon, yeah. I think Demis hopped off. Yeah. I think he did. But we can get that information or we can Yeah. yeah. He's a busy man sometimes. Yeah. Mm hmm <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> and all of you that care give up for us, we thank you. I I say this to my mother and my father all the time. They don't have to. Let me make that clear. They don't have to. They want to. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate I, I appreciate everybody who came on here to share today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, I'll get in contact with you later. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and just thank you to um, thank well, you, Sandy and Michelle. And, and I also you. sent you the link thank regarding you. the bill I said earlier. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. And before we close uh, today's advocacy days, I hear that a certain some special someone who's been advocating for a very long time has a birthday tomorrow. Do we want to wish our lovely Margaret Lee a happy birthday? Ooh, happy birthday! Happy birthday, Margaret! Happy birthday, Margaret, happy birthday, Margaret Lee! Margaret. Yeah. Happy <laughs> birthday to you! Happy birthday, Margaret! Happy birthday, Margaret! The legend, Margaret Lee. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy birthday, Margaret Lee. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you uh, next week, hopefully. So, thank you. And thank you to Tamika. Okay. Um, yeah. um, I, mm.